His Friendship's Heaven Flight um, put America back into the space. Not to minimize anything that had been done, uh, you know, by, by, by Alan Shepard or, or any of the, the two flights before him, but, but when, when John flew, we were going to orbit Earth. Um, we were going to, granted it was, we were second, but that wasn't important. For the United States, we were going to demonstrate that we were just as good, if not better, than our, our adversary at the time. Um, the whole world watched, and the whole world held their collective breath. Um, and it was just, it was very special for the nation to have, um, to have John Glenn become the first American who, who, who orbited our planet and, and was then able to talk about it. No question he became a national hero. Never flew again because the president wouldn't let him fly. He was so valuable to the nation as this iconic figure that uh, we just did not want to risk uh, putting him back in space again, which did not please him. But, uh, but John, you know, is a typical Marine. He says, OK, saluted and went on. En Floride, où une fois de plus, les dernières minutes de départ de l'astronaute américain. And report the astronaut's condition as excellent. Colonel Glenn, Cape Canaveral. 
And then as to not Glenn, well, weather still remains the big question mark. But the countdown for Colonel John Glenn, the countdown is again underway. With the entire world as our witness, the countdown begins at Cape Canaveral, Florida, for one of man's greatest adventures. It begins here, with these men, for they are the launch team. And from now until the instant of flight, the fate of today's mission rests principally upon their skills and judgments. The countdown is their master plan, and they proceed through its ritual with unhurried deliberation. Its pages contain the timetable of order they must follow to awaken a giant machine, to test its readiness, and to prime it for the one supreme moment for which it was created. Now, meter reads 19 volts. Trouble stand bound. Now, meter reads 11.5. Minute after minute, page upon page, the count continues. And in the night beyond this blockhouse, a modified Air Force Atlas rocket now hums with restless energy beneath a Mercury spacecraft as these men usher it toward its final minutes on Earth. Today is February 20th, 1962. And today, if all goes well, the men here will launch an American astronaut into orbit around the world in a spacecraft which he has named Friendship 7. Friendship 7 awaits its pilot. And the pilot has waited three years for this day. Three long, arduous years of study, of training, of waiting. And now he's ready. His name is John Glenn. John Glenn of New Concord, Ohio, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps. Married, father of two teenage children. Glenn has been a pilot over half of his 40 years, has flown in two wars, and is a veteran test pilot who five years earlier established a transcontinental flight record as the first man to average supersonic speeds across America. He volunteered for space flight, is one of seven astronauts selected for Project Mercury, the man and space program directed by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. <coughs> Two teammates have pioneered the way into space for Glenn. Astronauts Alan Shepard and Virgil Grissom tested the Mercury spacecraft on trailblazing suborbital missions, proving the equipment and pushing the program to the threshold of orbital flight. And now, it's Glenn's turn. Ready for pressurization? Now to Glenn falls the challenge of man's next advance into space, for he has been chosen to cross the threshold gained by Shepard and Grissom and to orbit the world. So the countdown continues for John Glenn. And it continues beyond this room for Friendship 7. And it continues this moment around the world.
John Glenn's ground-based co-pilots, men he knows well, with whom he's trained, and in whose judgment his life is entrusted this day. They are the flight controllers, and from the Mercury Control Center, within view of the launch complex, they make the decisions, issue the commands, that will govern the course of the mission. To these men throughout the flight will flood the facts needed for decision. The scope of their responsibility, of the entire operation, defies comprehension. Now, this very instant, the countdown for flight continues around the world, on three continents, on islands, in ships and planes, in lands where it's summer and tomorrow is near, in lands where it's winter, and this day is just beginning. Roger, how about you recovery? Oh, recovery, go. Roger, recovery. Uh, Roger, CTC, Mercury Control Center is go. Northeast of Cape Canaveral, 1,000 miles into the Atlantic, dawn's early light spills over the British Crown Colony of Bermuda, and Station 2 in the Mercury Network proceeds with the countdown. The tracking and telemetry stations, 18 in all, form an avenue of electronic checkpoints around the world to monitor and communicate with Friendship 7 as it passes overhead. If radar is the eyes of the station, then telemetry is the ears. Each second, telemetry will hear and record nearly 2,000 items of information radioed down from Friendship 7. And in the months to come, engineers and scientists will find in telemetry records the answers needed for the bolder space explorations of the future. Displays and recorders have been calibrated. Roger, thank you. Flight, this is m &O. Go ahead, m &O. All subsystems status green. Roger, m &O. understand all systems green. Latitude, five degrees north. Longitude, 10 degrees west a spot in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa, and Station 3, the Rose Knot, waits under the late morning sun for John Glenn. Operating out of Trinidad, Rose Knot will communicate with Friendship 7 and monitor its journey as it streaks across the empty ocean and out over Africa. Operation, this is bridge. We're proceeding at slow speed at about five knots. The course is one, nine, eight, through, over. the Mercury station on Gran Canary Island in the Spanish archipelago off of the African coast. It's midday at station five in Kano, Nigeria, deep in the continent of Africa. Flight data recorded here at Kano and at Zanzibar on Africa's east coast will relay through this transmitting station to London and then on to America. Far to the southeast of Kano, beyond the Zanzibar station, the ship's bell of the coastal sentry tolls the twilight of day in the emptiness of the Indian Ocean. To the east, some 2,500 miles from the coastal sentry, dusk blankets the network's eight station at Muche, near Perth, Western Australia halfway around the world okay. from Cape Canaveral. And the printout, code display. Okay, that's fine. 
Let's just uh, tweak her up on here. Today, February 20th, is fast fading over the Australian tracking sites at Muche and Woomera. And when Glenn arrives, tomorrow we'll greet him. But north and east across the Pacific, far beyond the Mercury station on the coral atoll called Canton Island, February 20th is just minutes old on Hawaii's garden island of Kauai. And there, men prepare for the arrival of Friendship 7. Ready for a 165 check. All roger. The All roger. Eastward again, deeper into the day that will soon awaken over the Americas. Eastward to the Gulf of California and to the Mercury Station at Wymus, Mexico. Real good, just waiting for liftoff. MNOTM, status green, proceeding with pre-pass calibrations. North of Mexico, in the pre-dawn along the west coast of the United States, the mountaintop station at Point Arguello, California, waits out the long countdown, ready to track John Glenn. All right, Roger, I eight. What is the present count? All right, Roger. Southeast now, to the farmlands of Texas, where the station at Corpus Christi continues its preparations for flight. I must count in Texas, please. Okay, affirmative. Roger, all systems, would you please commence pre-flight calibrations at this time since the countdown is progressing normally. Advise me when you have completed them. Far to the north and east of Corpus Christi beats the heart of the worldwide Mercury network the computing and communication center that bonds it into a working entity. This is the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Through here funnels the voice and teletype communications that link the global stations to Mercury control. The computers enable men to reach judgments within the flashes of time allowed for control of a spacecraft that moves faster than a brain can react. Throughout the flight, the computers will generate recommendations on whether the mission should continue or be aborted. They will determine locations of the spacecraft, the time it should begin re-entry, the point at which it will land. And the most vital of these findings will be transmitted instantaneously to Cape Canaveral. Around the world, all is ready. The men, the stations, the space vehicle. And now reporters learn from the astronaut's information officer if the most vital of all elements is ready, the man himself, John Glenn. What are the thoughts of a man about to rocket into history? Glenn is the astronaut, the man who will challenge space. But he is just one member of an international scientific endeavor that requires the genius and skills of some 40,000 other men and women scattered throughout the world. From the engineers and technicians who produce the space vehicle to the crews now preparing to launch it. 
from the tracking experts who will chart his voyage around the globe to the sailors now waiting at sea to recover him. Behind this day stands years of preparation, of research and testing, of planning and training. And the purpose of it all is knowledge. Knowledge of space and of how effectively man and spacecraft can function together in its hostile environment. Knowledge that will serve as the basis for space explorations of the future. Hard-won knowledge of benefit to all men, bought by sacrifice and dedication and courage.
launch position. AMR, CNS band beacons are on. Start interrogation in one minute. The countdown sweeps closer to the moment of flight and recovery teams here at the Cape and around the world ready themselves to aid the astronaut. Above all else, John Glenn's safety is paramount, the dictating factor in all planning. Never in all of history have so many people shared, without censorship, an adventure of such magnitude. Through all news media in all languages, all the peoples of the world are witness to this exploration of space to its success or failure. Time nears, and soon this earth path indicator in the capsule will begin showing John Glenn his changing positions above the world.
Across Africa, races Friendship 7 at 17,545 miles an hour, 300 miles a minute, 4 miles for every heartbeat of John Glenn. Friendship 7 streaks through the night of tomorrow and races toward the dawn of yesterday. Above the Indian Ocean flashes Friendship 7, far beyond human sight, seen only by the electronic instruments of the coastal sentry as she records the lightning passage of the man in space. John Glenn, the familiar time references of Earth no longer apply, for he journeys around our world in just 88 minutes, outracing the sun that needs 24 hours to circle the same globe. Uh, this is Friendship 7, uh, reading you loud and clear. How many? 
Uh, Roger, Friendship 7, we say Capcom, how may you, over. Roger, how you doing, Gordo? We're doing real fine up here. Everything is going very well, over. Very good, John, you sound good. Roger, that was sure a short day. Time passes rapidly, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, shortly, you may observe some lights down there. You want to take a check on them out to your right, over. Roger, I'm all set to see if I can't uh, get them in sight. Uh, Roger. Uh, any symptoms of uh, vertigo or nausea at all, over? Uh, negative. No symptoms whatsoever. I feel fine, over. Good show. Oh, Roger. I do have uh, a light in sight on the ground, over. Uh, Roger, I understand you're just off to your right there. That's affirmative. Just to my right, I can see a big pattern of light, apparently right on the coast. Uh, I can see a, the outline of a town and a very bright light just to the south of it. Hey, Roger, that's Perth and Rockingham you're seeing there. Uh, Roger, the lights show up very well. And thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Uh, Roger, sure well, John. signal. Wymus has lost contact, and Friendship 7 streaks home, an unseen comet darting across the land of its origin. Canaveral contact, how do you copy, over? Uh, Friendship 7 uh, to Canaveral, uh, read you loud and clear, how me, over? Roger, Friendship 7, Canaveral contact, read loud and clear, stand by with Capcom, please. Roger. Uh, Roger, still reading you. Uh, 7, this is Cape Coda, Bibi, you know. Uh, Roger, this is Friendship 7. Friendship 7, this is Bermuda Capcom. Hey Roger, this is Friendship 7. I'm controlling fly by wire present time. I have no uh, left jaw, low thrust. Minor trouble aboard Friendship 7. A malfunction in the automatic control system was causing the spacecraft to yaw in skid-like fashion, away from its proper flight attitude. But Glenn is overriding the faulty system and now manually controls Friendship 7 on fly-by-wire, directing its movements by hand control, much like a pilot flies a plane. fly-by-wire at present time. Understand? Friendship 7, this is Kano Capcom standing by. Hello, Kano. Friendship 7, we have a telemetry solid and check all your systems out okay. Uh, we will remind you to start a pre dark side uh, checklist as soon as you lose contact with us. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, this is Muge Contact. Friendship 7, this is Muge Contact. Do read, over. Okay, this is Friendship 7, to me. Under Friendship 7, Muge Capcom. Uh, will you confirm that your landing bag switch is in the off position, over? Uh, that is affirmative. Landing bag switch is in the center off position. All right, Roger, you haven't had any uh, banging noises or anything of this type at higher rates. Negative. All right, this, they wanted this answer. Right. Masked behind that routine report, the first hint of potential disaster. It came when astronaut Cooper relayed a request from Mercury Control, asking Glenn to check the status lights for the capsule's landing impact bag. Glenn reports, status normal. But ground stations are now receiving an ominous chilling signal, an indication that the heat shield on Friendship 7 seems to have come loose. 
Friendship 7, Hawaii Comtex. Hawaii, Friendship 7, over. Friendship 7, this is Hawaii Capcom. Uh, do you still consider yourself go for the next orbit? Affirmative, I am go for the next orbit. Roger, understand it. MCC confirms that they are go at the present time for third orbit. Friendship 7, Friendship 7, this is California Comtech. California Comtech, do you read? Over. Hello, California Comtech, Friendship 7, loud and clear, how many? Roger, Friendship 7, this is California Capcom, where's your loud and clear, John? Uh, Roger, receiving you much better now, Wally, you're very good. Uh, uh, John, the Aeromeds are real happy with you, you look real good up there. All right, fine, glad everything's working out. I feel real good, Wally, no problems at all. Good show. We're real pleased to let you go by this time, we'll see you next time around. This is Mercury Control. We now have a contact with our Guaymas, Mexico station and with the Corpus Christi, Texas tracking station. The Friendship 7 spacecraft is now committed to its third orbit. This is Mercury Control. In Mercury Control at Cape Canaveral, a decision must be made and soon. The signal pulsing down from Friendship 7 indicates still that the heat shield is loose. Could the signal be erroneous? There is no way to tell. But if it's true, then John Glenn could perish in a searing inferno when he plunges back into the atmosphere. The retro rockets that slow the spacecraft and head it back toward Earth are strapped over the shield. If they were left on after retro fire, instead of being jettisoned as in normal re-entry, then their straps might hold the shield in place before they burn off they might possibly save Glenn from the 3,000 degrees of re-entry heat until he's deep enough into the atmosphere for its force to hold the shield in place. But the decision must be made soon. Even now, Glenn is streaking toward the United States, and he must begin the retro sequence 300 miles west of California if he's to land in the planned recovery area 700 miles south and east of Florida. We'll give you the countdown uh, for retro sequence time, John. You're looking good. Uh, Roger, we only have five zero seconds to retrograde. Over. Uh, that's a firm. I'll give you a mark of uh, 45 mark. California, uh, California. This is Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Uh, we'd like to leave the package on at least through Texas. So keep tell him to keep his retro jettison switch off. Uh, John, leave your retro pack on uh, through your pass over Texas. 20 Please. seconds. Roger. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Roger. Retros are firing. Oh, Roger, baby. Are they ever? It feels like I'm going back toward Hawaii. Don't do that. You want to go on the East Coast. Roger. Fire retro light is green. Roger. Roger. Retros have stopped. A hundred. I keep your retro pack on until you pass Texas. That's affirmative. Shut. That's real, real good looking flight from uh, what we've seen. Yes, sir. Looks good, Wally. We'll see you back east. Right. All right, boy. Texas Capcom Cape Flight. Go ahead, Cape Flight. Go ahead. Uh, we have decided to re enter with the pack on. This is Texas Capcom Friction 7. We are recommending that you leave the retro package on through the entire re entry. This means that you will have to override. 05G switch, which is expected to occur at 044333. This also means that you will have to manually retract the scope. Do you read? Uh, this is Friendship 7. Now, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. Not at this time. This is the judgment of Cape Flight. Now, Roger. Say again your instructions, please. Over. We are recommending that the retro package not, I say again, not be jettisoned. This means that you will have to override the 05G switch, which is expected to occur at 044353. This is approximately four and a half minutes from now. This also means that you will have to retract the scope manually. Do you understand? Uh, Roger, understand. I will have to make a manual uh, 05G 
re-entry when it occurs, and uh, bring the scope in uh, manually. Is that a firm? That is affirmative. Friendship 7. Roger. Go ahead, Cape, friend 7. I recommend you go to re-entry attitude and retract the scope manually at this time. Uh, Roger, retracting scope manually. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're not sure whether or not your landing bag has deployed. Uh, we feel it's far safer to re-enter uh, with the retro package on. Uh, we see no difficulty at this time in that type of re-entry. Over. Uh, Roger. Understand. Friendship 7 is lost. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I think the uh, pack just let go. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape. Do you read? This is Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. Uh, 7, this is Cape. Transmitting blind. Okay, print ship seven, over. Uh, seven, this is Cape. Do you read, over? The furnace-like heat of re-entry has created a barrier of ionization around Friendship 7, holding all voice communication. plunges back toward Earth, a fiery meteorite. Okay, Friendship 7, over. Friendship 7, this is Cape. Do you read, over? Hello, okay, Cape. Friendship 7, do you receive, over? The thickening atmosphere breaks his descent, slowing Friendship 7 from 17,500 miles an hour to 1,300 miles an hour in slightly over three minutes. And the forces of gravity slam against John Glenn until he weighs eight times his normal weight. Steelhead is the code name for the destroyer Noah, waiting to recover Friendship 7. But John Glenn cannot hear the message. Right around 443 flight. It was about on time. Keep talking, Al. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape, over. I Friendship 7, this is Cape. How do you read, over? All right, you're reading a lot and clear. How you doing? My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. I had great chunks of that retro pack breaking off all the way through. That's right, it's it break off, is that correct? Uh, Roger, altimeter off the pack indicating 80,000. Roger, radio loud and clear. Rocking quite a bit, I may still have some of that pack on, I can't damp it either. Going to drug early. It's a rocky first part of the side. Drug came out. Drug is out. Roger, drug came out at 3,000 in about a 90 degree yaw. 
Roger, is the drogue holding off? Roger, drogue looks good. Roger. The scope did not come out. Checklist. Roger, pumping the scope out. Let's go. Say again. Oh, Roger, re-entry checklist complete. Standing by for a minute and ten. Roger. Coming down on ten, snorkels are open. Roger. Main chute is on green. Chute is out in reef condition at 10,800 feet in. Beautiful chute. Chute looks good. On O2 emergency and the chute looks very good. Rate of descent has gone to about 42 feet per second. The chute looks very good. Hello, Mercury Recovery. This is Friendship 7. Do you receive? Mercury, Friendship 7. This is Steelhead. Loud and clear. Over. Right here, Steelhead. Uh, Friendship 7. The shoot looks very good. Over. journey of 81,000 miles through three days and three nights in just four hours and 56 minutes. At 3.04 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friendship 7 comes to rest aboard the United States destroyer, NOAA, and John Glenn returns to the people of Earth. A change of clothes, a breath of cool air, a short debriefing. Then, Glenn leaves the NOAA, heading for the aircraft carrier Randolph, under the golden splendor of his fourth sunset of the day. John Herschel Glenn, Jr., Lieutenant Colonel, United States Marine Corps. Married, father of two teenage children. Today, John Glenn and the Mercury team challenge space, and they won.